I mean, we'll probably both know people who are on Telegram who have never met each other, and yet they're moving like five, six figure sums around because they just trust each other based on social history. And I think that's more the direction things will go because it's just the way that world works as opposed to people trying to like prevent fraud by scanning driving licenses. It really doesn't make a difference. Okay, so today we're happy to welcome back on the show co-founder and CEO of Checked, Fraser Edwards. Welcome back, Fraser. Cool. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for having us again. Yeah, it's been a while. Good to be back. Yeah, so probably less than a year, but more than six months. So, of course, that that's uh, a long time in this world, both in terms of the context of crypto, Web3, but then, of course, AI, and especially with that, with that kind of convergence. So we've had you on the show previously. We've talked about self-sovereign identity. It was a, a real kind of deep dive into, into that space. You know, Chet's mission is still the same. It's, it's still payment infra for decentralized ID. For those that don't know, it's running on a dedicated Cosmos network. Of course, Cosmos, a really exciting ecosystem at the moment, lots of interesting things happening over there. So we might have a little bit of a primer on, on self-sovereign identity, but actually the, the main reason why we've got you on today is to talk about this kind of intersection between Web3 and AI. Of course, the promise of blockchains generally are that they can allow for this kind of trust layer for the web. And of course, in the context of identity and things like decentralized identifiers, verifiable credentials and all that kind of stuff. And of course, for those that don't know, you know, checked, we have a kind of historical relationship with you guys. You are part of our portfolio. You as a team technically went through Basecamp 5 back in 21, but we have a, a, a relationship with a wider um, identity initiative that was kind of the, the genesis behind Checked, going back even further than that, I think, to 2017, something like that. And so we're really going to talk today about the, this kind of uh, new roadmap around verifiable AI. Is it possible to have proof of personhood without scanning people's eyeballs? And then actually, there's lots of interesting things happening in a regulatory context here in Europe with IDAS coming through, I think you said next year which will mandate a number of digital identities, wallets, and, and stuff like that. So maybe before we kind of jump into that, we can just have a quick one minute on on who is uh, Fraser Edwards. And then, of course, and perhaps a primer on the mission statement more generally of Checked and, and I guess the, the importance of self-sovereign identity and, and some of those buzzwords I mentioned around DIDs and VCs. Cool. Yeah, happy to. And again, thanks Thanks for having us again. So uh, yeah, hi, Fraser, CEO of Checked. And like Jamie was saying, building privacy preserving payment infrastructure for decentralized ID. So means that whoever is partaking in that ecosystem where you own your own data, you control it. We make sure all the commercials, all the payments, all the money effectively surrounding it works out. The reason why we're focused on this is myself and my co-founder Anchor were both uh, consultants for our sins, tech consultants, building out self-sovereign ID solutions. And every time we took them into clients, especially companies that have these big data silos of individuals' data, they always responded with, where's the money? If we release all this data to individuals, how do we make money? How do we monetize this stuff? So after about six months of, I guess, trying to do this and take it into clients and seeing the same thing, we both decided to go out and solve this for ourselves and I guess for the wider market. And I guess quite nicely that you, you mentioned, I think it was over six, but within a year. So within the last six months or maybe just over, we got basically the payment infrastructure running on the network. So the ability for individuals to own their data, control it, and we can kind of resolve those payments around it. And the whole real, I guess, mission or purpose of Checked is get data out of companies, or at least a copy of it, and under the control of individuals where they can do whatever they want with it. And that's kind of where that's, I guess, crossing over into AI world is establishing trust using kind of decentralized identifiers for companies, individuals, verifiable credentials for data, so it's got provenance and trust, and be able to kind of really build this like trust layer or trust mesh across, well, I guess the world and the internet, regardless of whether it is an individual or an AI, and probably a topic that both of us would have heard for, to your point, back since like 2017, was the idea that self-sovereign always had this concept of agents, and it's only now that really they're starting to come to the fore, which is 
really cool to see this conceptual idea for those who don't know of an AI or an agent that operates on your behalf using your own personal data as corpus and your own behavior to go and achieve things for you. And that was always an idea in SSI, but it's actually starting to get worked on now, which is pretty cool to see and one of the things we're really excited about. So again, maybe just as a primer for those that aren't as familiar with the whole self-shopping identity space and its innovations, could you just quickly explain DIDs and BCs? Just so we've covered that off and then it allows us to kind of just reference them shorthand. Yeah, absolutely. So decentralized, it's it's unhelpful because you've got DID as decentralized ID and then decentralized identifiers. So the latter is typically these identifiers which can live on chain, can live off chain, but they're Typically, the on-chain ones are used to identify companies or organizations, organizations issuing data, receiving data. And the reason they're on-chain is so that you can actually resolve that trust back to whoever issued that data in the first place using kind of the keys. Those same keys are used to sign verifiable credentials, and those credentials get issued to individuals. And individuals have DIDs as well, but they're typically private. So they don't live on a ledger. They are pairwise, so they're between an organization and an individual, which basically means if you have the same individual appearing at different organizations, the organizations can't collude to understand who that person is. They're basically seen as a unique individual every time. And the big benefit of the going back to credentials is that they are kind of they're signed by the originating organization. So whoever issues that data, the data goes and gets controlled by an individual. They can combine as many credentials as they want into the idea of proofs. So you could take data from various different places, combine it into one to send to another organization. And the beauty of kind of credentials as a whole is Whoever receives that data knows that it came from certain organizations who are typically the trustworthy issuers of that data, and they'll know that it went via the individual who actually is the owner and the control of that data. So you've got this, what is typically called the trust triangle. But really, the the characteristics of all of this are individual owns their data, controls it, and everyone gets trust and provenance in the data as it moves around. So there's no situation where you get a piece of data and you don't know where it came from. It's always got some provenance through that trust triangle. And I I think, you know, most sensible people, sane people, or just people that are kind of just using the web on a day-to-day basis, even in a rudimentary form, understand that trust is broken, probably intuitively increasingly so. It's just much harder to trust who you're interacting with, both on the end of a mobile phone, through an app, uh, or just kind of you know browsing, navigating around the web. And that's not necessarily in and of itself solved by, by crypto itself, right? There's huge amounts of scams that happen in crypto. So crypto doesn't necessarily automatically, blockchains don't automatically solve for the problems of trust. But I know you guys have been highlighting some really interesting, almost escalations in the crisis of trust, albeit anecdotal. And it'd be good maybe if you could just talk through that kind of escalation of the problem before we then get into, I guess, this leap from verifiable credentials to verifiable AI. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's probably two examples that really crystallize it. So one example was, I was just looking this up in the in the background, a $25 million deep fake hack or deep fake theft in Hong Kong. And we're just talking about it before recording. And effectively, um, for what I understand, it was a multinational company. They bring one of uh, the frauds to somehow get one of the, the staff who controls the accounts and has kind of final approval on large transfers onto, a, I think, a Zoom call or at least a, a conference call. They join the call. There's not just a single the single fraudster. They've kind of brought on this panel of different people and everyone's got kind of generated video coming on the channels. They've got uh, generated voice, I think. At least one of them did. So this person who approves all these accounts kind of comes onto this call surrounded by a bunch of people and is almost kind of gently coaxed into signing off this like $25 million transaction. And yet none of the other people on that call were genuine. There was only kind of the I guess the finance director or CFO and basically a fraudster and everything else surrounding it was was entirely faked. And it just kind of comes down to like the ease with which you can generate content now. I guess for those who are in London, that was a famous example, I think a few weeks ago, which was, I think, a deep fake of Sadiq Khan saying something that was then obviously put out and did, and did the rounds before it was taken down. And then an example I, I was told about recently 
I think it was at a workshop with the EU Commission, was you can now buy an image that looks like you've taken a picture of a passport and the past, the picture of the passport looks genuine, but the whole thing has been generated. And apparently it's for the cost of about 20 quid. And so you've now got the situation where if you're not using verifiable credentials, you're basically relying on the fact that this image is genuine. And I think it's probably going to be one of the biggest accelerators towards using VCs and using credentials because everything before you could rely on those images being relatively trustworthy. And now all of that is out the window and it's not as if the price point is particularly high. So there's all these different factors going on. And it's, I guess it's a classic game of cat and mouse with fraudsters. Whenever they get access to new tooling, they're normally the first to use it to go and start kind of scamming or defrauding people. And then it's the game of everyone else to go catch up and and catch them out. And I think that's where really VCs are going to be holding their own is they aren't susceptible to just generating content. You need to know where it came, comes from and you need to have a trustworthy link between it. So slightly terrifying, but I think thankfully if we've actually got the tooling to, to fight back and it just needs implementing, which is great. So it's, it's kind of a nice segue into, so when we're saying VCs, we've been verifiable credentials and effectively, you know, provably being able to verify the credentials of a, a person or organization or as you were alluding to earlier, even an agent, like this agent is a representative of. So obviously we're perhaps some way from that right now. We're still just trying to prove people are people or, and you know certain things about those individuals uh, in particular contexts. But you know maybe we could just kind of go into your, you did a recent blog post, I believe, on VAI, uh, which kind of set the scene for this new roadmap for, for Czech. So maybe you could kind of, Talk us through that blog post, it's kind of key concepts and and then how that then informs some of the solution that you guys are building out. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously there's been a huge amount of noise and hype in the market around kind of where AI is going and just huge amount huge amounts of investment and just the speed it's going at is incredible. And then at the same time, we've obviously been hearing these, I guess, case studies on news stories where it is very much built around trust being broken and even more broken than it was before. And kind of, I guess, generative AI acting as this catalyst to make some things a lot easier and a lot better, but also really break other things. So we started looking very, th- looking at this uh, of, as a case of like, this world is going to come along and therefore we need to find our place in it and how we rebuild that trust to establish that trust when these tools are available. I guess in the same way that we'll maybe touch on it a bit, but like WorldCoin looked at the advent generative AI coming through and realized that proof of humanity or proof of personhood was going to be a really big problem. And that is certainly one area we're looking at and doing so without kind of the need for biometrics, but also looking at a whole range of other other solutions. So some of it was around looking at data going into AI training models and the fact that it needs to be kind of either licensed or clear of biases or the biases are known so you can counteract them, that you need to know the source of this, that you need to know it's, it's kind of another example is you could have this like circular effect with AI models where it's based on a certain bias and then because it outputs, and especially if it's trained public on public data, if it generates more bias, then it will also then read that in the second time round and basically will skew off whichever direction it wants to go in. Also looking then at uh, the location of this equipment or G- like GPUs and if you've got nexuses or clusters of, of, of GPUs, they're much more efficient than they're if they're kind of geographically dispersed just because they need to be near each other. And then some of the other ideas around kind of content credentials, which Adobe is really heavily looking into. And I think one of the reasons why I'm particularly interested in it is it's got a really nice marry up with checked kind of focus on financial infrastructure and payment infrastructure because you've got content credentials for content being licensed or created And there's the idea that actually if it's created by a human and it's provably created by a human, you may end up with like an almost artisanal like increase in value because it was created by a human, regardless of whether you think that the quality is better or not than an AI, which I I find really interesting. And then that final one that we touched on earlier, which is that combination of AI agents acting on your behalf. So there's an element, there's kind of elements of improving trust. And then there's also using, I guess, AI the other way around, which is taking advantage of the data as you're going to be collecting it, 
and then making your life infinitely smoother. So I think that I can't remember who has done this. There's an example of someone using an AI to book their favorite restaurant without having to go through the process. But I think that's really going to be the beginning. It'll be like travel itineraries, pretty like negotiating mortgages, like helping pretty much guide anything you want to. So there's a whole blend of options in there. And I think the fun part for this now is going into more discovery of like, which are the most pressing problems or maybe they're all the most pressing problem. And therefore, like, how do we go and enable those at scale? So it's, it's an exciting time. It's busy. It's fun stuff. So maybe if we work backwards from like, so the holy grail would be to be able to allow every individual to kind of leverage AI to make their world better, right? And so, you know, we've, of course, always made this argument that for that to happen, you need to be able to trust the AI is going to serve your interests, your your, and enhance your sovereignty versus necessarily just um, fire sale your your kind of needs and desires to, to a given platform. So maybe we kind of we, we work backwards from that and we, we kind of start on this first use case, which is proof of personhood. So how do you guys solve for proof of personhood without the requirement for this kind of collection of biometric data? And why do you think that's important? Yeah, good question. I wrote about this a while ago. I think anything that collects biometrics into one place starts to get very dangerous at a given size. I think probably the primary, or like, I mean, there's obviously like examples that are more historic than this, but probably the worst one that's been recent was the biometric database that contained a lot of, I think was built by UNHCR for the the High Commission for Refugees for the UN, but it was built for recording, I think, Rohingya uh, refugees coming out of Myanmar. And basically, if you were present on that database, you could easily be identified to be a Rohingya refugee. It meant that you could basically be, if you ended up back in the country, and some did, you could be very easily targeted if you were found. And so I think there's an inherent danger of, like, if you build these biometric databases and they have a known set of characteristics like world coins because of where it's been tested a lot of it is i guess more developing countries and therefore if you're on that list at the moment like you could kind of get profiled just based on the fact that you're on that list so i think there's for us there's always been this like it's it feels a bit dangerous and dystopian to be building this global like biometric register regardless of how you do it but I think the other thing for us is you don't necessarily need to. And so the way that we're looking at it is more building up a series of social signals from diffuse issuers or d- diverse issuers and using those to prove to whatever necessary degree that you are kind of a human or unique human or the right human. And so examples of that might be, I have a telegram handle that I can prove is over 10 years old and I can prove it has lineage in terms of the maybe the events that I've shown up to, the projects that I've contributed to, the roles that I've had, maybe even Twitter spaces and AMAs and using these kind of diffuse signals to say, okay, enough unique individuals agree over a long enough time span that I'm a unique person and therefore like I am human and be able to do that. And the other nice thing about that system is you can level it up and you can level it down. So you could go, okay, this is my handle on certain platform and we both attended the same event and we can prove it to each other. Or you can build it all the way up to, okay, I need to go and register a bank account and therefore I need to provide a passport or a driving license. And so you really get a lot more granularity or fine kind of grainness on what you're providing in the negotiation of it rather than like, okay, there's only this option and it's scanning your eyeballs. For us, it just provides way more flexibility and it also allows people to negotiate what they think is important. I mean, we'll probably both know people who are on Telegram who have never met each other and yet they're moving like five, six figure sums around because they just trust each other based on social history. And I think that's more the direction things will go because it's just the way that world works as opposed to people trying to like prevent fraud by scanning driving licenses. It really doesn't make a difference. I guess that social component as well is more networked, it's more bottom up, it's more organic, and ultimately the user's in control of that process. So, so that then enables things like credentialing around content creation. Um, it allows for participation through data or otherwise in the training of AI and then presumably kind of the, the, the ownership of AI. What are the steps then to get us towards this kind of agent-based systems where we can 
have agents that can both represent our sovereignty or carry out our sovereignty and, and perhaps even enforce it somehow. Yeah, absolutely. I kind of see all of this as a bit of a reputation game in a strange way where I think the first part is for individuals getting all that data out of these massive silos. So I think there's about to be this wave of pulling data and be able to prove it in some regard so that it's not just you self-stating something, there's something, there's kind of cryptography and credentials standing behind it. So I think the first part of that is going to be this mass kind of pull of data from wherever people can get it. And I think that's almost like mirroring what's happening with, say, the larger language models where they're like scraping the internet and just getting content from wherever they can or paying Reddit for it. But I think eventually there'll be a similar thing for individuals, which is almost a toolkit to go and fetch your data from wherever it is, pull it in, and then be able to start running things on top of it. And I think having to use credentials to get that data out so that it's prove like there's some provenance or at least you i guess not gameable i think the second bit is then what models do you use and how do you know they're safe and i think really that's where you're going to have a, a that's where that reputation system comes in or that reputation game comes in because you're obviously going to have people offering to provide these models whether it is for a fee whether it's for free or these different type of models and then you've also got to know if okay so if it's free realistically, you are probably providing your data. And like what happens with social networks at the moment, you are the product. But even if you're paying, does that data stay with you? Does it go off to a server that then is processed? Do you own that data once it goes? And the kind of the, the classic Google model of you get access to Gmail and everything, but actually none of your content is yours. You're just licensing it. And then like even if you've got that model, is that model free of biases? Will it act on your behalf in a way that is completely trustworthy? So I think then at this point, you're going to have people creating models, building a reputation for creating models, having that reputation or not for them being unbiased. But then you're going to have the flip side, which is the, I guess, the people auditing them to check that is actually true. And then obviously those people have their own reputation that you've got to judge them upon. And then I would imagine it's going to turn into like a social, like, basically individuals reviewing those uh, models across a platform to say, okay, I've used this for six months to a year. It works great in this scenario and it keeps on trying to sell me stuff that I just don't have any interest in. And so I think at that point, then you've got, again, that reputation of all the various different parts and how it all fits together. So I think there's going to be a huge amount of creativity, but ultimately I think a lot of it is going to come down to what I guess I've discussed on this podcast before, where it's a lot of trust, a lot of reputation, because otherwise you could just skew down something where you're kind of being coached into something that actually you don't really understand, really doesn't reflect your wishes. Just pretty, I guess, terrifying and dystopian, but I think we'll get it right. So I guess you know the, the big promise of agent-based systems with kind of sovereignty enabled or like whatever the term is that, that we go on and use or you know verified or whatever it might be is that it allows for hyper personalization so rather than give you a generic answer when you you kind of go in and ask it a question it can give you a hyper personalized reply and then potentially if you've given authority to it can go off and then execute whatever it might be that can then also potentially allow us to even move away from any command at all where it's kind of predictive it kind of just it knows your needs before you've even asked it because you share everything with it it's kind of like the Alexa that you could trust to be your best friend with your deepest, darkest secrets and your wallet. Um, so that's kind of the promise, but clearly to get there, there are kind of different drivers. So the first one is, well, how do you make that UX even possible for an end user? The second one, which I think you alluded to anyway, which is more general to decentralized identity, but what is the commercial imperative for organizations, platforms to participate? And then the third one is the, the regulatory conditions. I know people have different attitudes towards regulation, both in terms of crypto and AI. Europe, for better or worse, is a first mover in the context of, of AI and regulation, and as well as data, data privacy. So how do you see those? I mean, are those the three things? Have I missed anything? And then how do you see those th three things playing out to create this momentum towards your vision around verifiable AI? It's a really good question. I think the bit that I'm fascinated on in the first instance is if we get all of this right, do browsers disappear? Like, 
is that a thing where if you just everything is kind of planned for you you're almost operating through like a chat interface or like voice and especially with i guess like ar maybe coming back a little bit as well like does that spell the end of the browser i i don't know if it does but i think the user interface is, is going to be super key i think the way I often think about, I guess, digital identity wallets and digital identity wallets and the way that this will work is somewhat similar to like the Apple wallet and Siri of like, you never really open up either of those apps to go and like actually do anything inside them, but they just sit there kind of behind the scenes operating whenever you need them. And I guess the same to some degree with Alexa, but like it's just kind of there and available. I think the key thing is going to be making sure you're providing consent in a way that is like you're not doing it all the time. So it's not the burden that we have with cookies at the moment where you go onto a website. The first thing you've got to do is get rid of that. So I think there's going to be like some element of consent that establishes that it's not a burden, but also whilst freeing up the agent to then go and do whatever you need in a way that is is good. I think we're the concept that hasn't come into this yet is like liability. Like if it makes a decision that you disagree with, whose responsibility is that? If it's like all based on your data, based on the trading that you've done, and yet it goes off and does something you disagree with, like how does that whole model work? I think that's going to be fascinating. And if it's self hosted as well, right? I guess that's the other component. Exactly, exactly. And then I think in terms of the financial side, I think it's why we find this so interesting from like a checked network perspective, especially things like content credentials, like actually having an incentive to license this stuff and prove it and prove it's from an individual or a human starts to get really interesting. I think as well, the way that we've got the, or the kind of building this out where if you're a verifier or receiver of data, you're having to kind of pay back to the issue of that data in the first place. I think that's going to be kind of necessary because otherwise companies, I mean, we've seen this with Reddit and a bunch of other platforms, Twitter's a good example, or X, like just locking off APIs because they're not being rewarded for the data that's being scraped. And I think that's going to happen at the same level at individual layer. As, I mean, it's always our thesis, but I think AI kind of provides this different dimension of why people are going to be pulling that data to go and do other things. So I think that's, I think that's going to be crucial and your final point, I guess, on regs. It's a good question. So obviously in, in the EU, you've got EIDAS coming through. I think that's going to be fascinating because it will just, one, it gives, I think, almost every EU citizen the right to have a digital ID. So it's it's not mandated, but it's the right. And it's very much opt-in. I think the extension of that, though, is that every country has to provide a digital ID wallet. So they have to provide some kind of repository for this data, at least for the bare minimum. Uh, but the flip side is, I think every company or every company of a certain size has to accept that data. So if you show up with a digital credential over a certain size, every company has to accept it. So I think that will then shift us into this world where companies are receiving digital data rather than like scanning documents or scanning passports or PDFs or whatever. Everyone's kind of forced down this track. And then at that point, it really starts to open up because companies that the way I like to think, think about this is a bit like when open banking came into the UK. And in the I don't know if you can remember what the process was like, but everyone hated it. And then the banks basically split into two camps. And there were the ones who did the bare minimum. And as a result, they haven't really gone anywhere. And then the flip side were the people who were like, this is actually an opportunity because it opens up a load of services that we either can't provide ourselves or we can get access to elsewhere. And I think this will be the same. You'll have companies that do the bare minimum are the ones who go, oh, new tech opportunity. We can do whatever we want with this. And there's a load of power here. So I think that will then open up more data to come out on top of it. So I think it's, it's a weird case where regardless of where you sit in terms of we've got a few um, libertarians in our team and they're very much like hate regs, hate, gov hate big government, but even they're willing to admit that inside the EU, this seems to be favorable in terms of it's still opt-in, it's the right, but it's kind of forcing companies to innovate and start issuing or accepting this data. Where it goes on the AI front, I don't know. That's probably one bit where I'm not, I'm not an expert, but I think on the digital ID stuff, I think it's really, really, it's going to push things forward very, very quickly because it's something like the next two or three years, it, it's almost, it will come through. So maybe if we kind of um, close off with then how the, the checked roadmap speaks to this over the next 12, 18 months, I don't know how far out you, uh, you, you kind of, draft these things yeah so i think the biggest thing on there at the moment was this exploratory phase so there was some stuff we're looking into which is around ad tech there was some on-chain activity credential stuff that's going into creds 
But a big part of it was like, okay, we've got all these ideas going into verifiable AI. Which ones of these, like, we've got all these ideas, which ones make sense of solutions, which ones are viable commercial solutions, which ones are like demanded in the market, and therefore, what do we go and build on top of that? So I think we've probably got like a little bit more of the exploratory phase to do with going out to market, testing all these various different ideas. And I think what's great is we're already seeing that some of them have a great fit. Like there's people being like, this is this is a genuine problem. We need this solving. But there's probably other ones that we can maybe let drop away and maybe not spend all of our time there. So I think that's about to shift into, okay, how do we as a team start like facilitating these, especially at like a use case or a vertical level using the same infrastructure? And then at the network layer, making sure that we've got everything that really enables this stuff at scale, especially the... I mean, it's the original purpose of Checked was like getting data out from these silos into individuals. So really doubling down on that. So things like we're looking at opening up payments in stable coins, even if they're being resolved into gas fees in check under the hood for, for the network. So still having that burn of check tokens on the network, but actually having payments across and stable. So that's that's obviously a big part. But also looking into much more complex commercial models. So the ability to start having those different ways of, of like, whether it's subscription-based, volume-based discounting, all that kind of stuff. So that's probably later in the year. The big focus for, for now is looking at how we facilitate these big verticals and who do we work with to go and do it quickly? Because AI is going at such a clip that we need to make sure it's kind of going in there. And I think, it's, yeah, I guess the other thing is there's so much going on at the same time. The more we can partner up with people to build this out, the quicker it will go as opposed to ourselves. And I think a little bit like, I can't remember the exact terminology outlier used, but you're kind of open stack and always building with that in mind so that we're nailing our bit but we're working with people who are like experts in their field for every piece so yeah a lot of explore a lot of exploration at the moment like market testing and i think we're probably about to hit the point of like okay let's go and start figuring out how we build all this with partners and do so at, at pace very cool. Well, look, it's always good to catch up with you guys and, and hear about all the progress you've been having. I mean, the, the thing is, every time we speak, the, the use case gets stronger and, you know, more diverse. So I think, you know, AI is proving out, you know, what we always feared, I guess, at the, the genesis of all this, that whilst it has huge enabling potential, the world's just getting crazier. And so, you know, this requirement for blockchains, Web3, and then, of course, checked in, in the context of that, it's a greater requirement. So good luck in, in navigating that. Looking forward to hearing some more of these updates as you as you hit product market fit with the various different products and the solution. And I've, I just remembered one thing that slipped off my mind was looking at how proof of personhood fits into creds. It's naturally built for it anyway. Um, the ability to collect all these proofs in different places. So that's a very natural one that we can, and we we kind of already have people doing this. One of the examples that we have is having any of our team and our ambassadors and mods be able to prove who they work for inside Telegram without having to leave. So they can share credentials native to Telegram without having to leave the channel, all with the focus on like protecting ambassadors, sorry, protecting community members from fraudsters and scammers. So there's, yeah, there's so much going on. And I think what's going to be really exciting is seeing the not just one solution, I think, but to your point, the combination of all of these coming together where we can see that like realization of a vision, which is individuals having that data, having an AI that acts on their behalf in a trustworthy, unbiased, like super efficient manner, and just the efficiency gains or the tailored solutions or unique experiences you can get as a result of having all of those together. I think that's going to be the most exciting part. It's not just seeing like an individual bit go. I think you'll be seeing it all, all together as once. Very cool. All right. Well, look, great to catch up again, Fraser. Looking forward to speaking to you, well, probably later in the year. Things happen quickly. Absolutely. And thanks again.